My name is Jeff Miller uh, with Forefront Agronomy out of Plainview, Texas. And I've uh, just had the opportunity to work with some guys over the last several years in looking at, um, at some of these different systems that we've talked about over the last two days. Uh, and uh, so we're going to kind of focus on some things that Tate's been doing on his farm, uh, as well as a couple other uh, things that we've pulled through with, with some of the stuff that we're doing. So we just called it less is more, uh, more of a practical approach, uh, taking a good Red Raider stab at it and uh, going from there. So, uh, came across this quote uh, from Chris uh, in the Southwest Farm Press about some of the things that he was doing on his farm with uh, relation to wide row. And, uh, and it really resonated just because a lot of the questions that I get with growers that, that we work with is, you know, we hear about these guys doing some of this stuff. What's, uh, you know, what's it yielding? And which is, you know, an important aspect, but uh, really that's not the reason why we're doing this. It's, uh, um, you know, it's about profitability and, and uh, it, it's hard to raise <coughs> yields to that level in a short amount of time, but we have identified opportunities to, uh, you know, reduce some of the inputs that we're working with to, um, you know, to, to be more profitable at the end of the day. So weather is always a big uh, aspect and uh, drives really everything that we do around here, uh, puts us in a good mood, puts us in a bad mood. And uh, so <clears throat> we're constantly trying to work with that. Uh, I like to say optimize the weather whenever we get it and uh, also offset it whenever we don't get what we want. And uh, really that's kind of, you know, while we've driven ourselves to uh, uh, to look at some of these different systems, you know, look at no-till, look at uh, you know regenerative ag, look at the wide row systems to help offset a lot of the uh, negative weather impacts that we've had. And so I just kind of circled a couple of things uh, up here on our uh, on the one of the weather forecasting services that we utilize. And you know, August there in the red is is going to be like August always is. It's going to be hot. Uh, looks like we're going to have a little bit less rainfall, at least what they're predicting. And so how do you set yourself up for success to be able to handle that? Uh, we do have some positive things this year, at least showing up on a forecast that didn't last year. Uh, you know, we will have some moisture, hopefully, and a little bit of cooler weather to uh, kick off that season. And so what can we do during that time frame to optimize our systems, optimize our plants to be able to, to get us through a hot August? Well, so we've uh, been participating in a project uh, just started last year, but going out and uh, pulling soil samples, running those through um, uh, one of the labs that we work with that uh, not only focuses on just a simple soil test, but utilizing the Haney method to, uh, you know, to, to look at these systems. And so we're comparing, I don't know, there's like 15 fields across the whole high plains here that we're looking at. And, uh, and actually, Chris brought this to my attention when he got some of his results. But looking at last year's results versus this year's results, uh, you know, with just some of the changes that he's made on his particular operation, you know, just seeing that we are making some improvement with relation to some of the nutrients out there. And just put that up, up in a, uh, uh, you know, percentage form, but seeing some increases in nitrogen, sulfur, and some of that's probably due to his fertility program, but showing calcium growing, our magnesium levels, uh, you know, slightly dropping, and uh, you know, putting some zinc and manganese in there as well. Did see a drop in phosphorus, but you'll see on the next slide that uh, plant available phosphorus is is growing. So look, taking a look more at the uh, physical and biological aspects uh, that these that these tests pull in. You know, seeing an increase in organic matter. Uh, HT3 in, is the biological activity that's happening out there. So seeing a big increase there. Uh, also seeing water extractable carbon uh, grow, which would explain why that organic matter equation is, is growing. Getting a better carbon to nitrogen ratio. VAST is a soil aggregation score. Uh, so getting better aggregation, you know, better soil structure all while dropping pH, which is probably why some of those nutrients on the last page are becoming a little more available. 
And then finally looking at some of the uh, nutrients here that uh, through the H3A extraction, which shows what is actually available to the plant using that H3A weak acid, we see a pretty significant increase in available uh, phosphorus, potassium, and calcium while also seeing on our base saturations, lowering our K just slightly, uh, but really offsetting these high magnesium soils that we've got in this part of the world and replacing that with calcium. So overall, we should start seeing uh, you know, better uh, soil health, better plant health all the way through to get us through those, those tough times of the season. And so just uh, really put this together last night after listening to Chris talk, and putting these, uh, putting these two things together to show, hey, we are making some improvement and we're seeing this in a fairly quick fashion. Uh, so talking about Widro, just a couple of basics uh, as guys are uh, starting to think about this, look at this, some of the things that we've uh, noticed over the years and, and Tate's a much better person at this than I am, just uh, general observations. But, you know, really in my, case is looking at this as a way to uh, grow out here in a in a semi-arid desert uh, no other way around it we're going to have times of the year where we've got plenty of moisture but we're going to have more often where we don't have enough and building a, a plant that has the ability to go out and grab extra moisture grab extra nutrients build a bigger stalk so that we can move those nutrients up and down is really kind of the the gist of it uh, from my standpoint um, you know, really, I feel like it's got a great place in marginal, you know, marginally irrigated dry land, you know, where we've got plenty of water. I don't know that it's the right thing to do. Would love to play with it a little bit. Uh, but it, you know, that boils back down to your individual, uh, operation and what you're trying to get done. Uh, you know, we feel like, you know, in, uh, you know, sharing water amongst different crops. Uh, under these limited irrigation schemes, uh, works really well, you know, but you got to have good ground cover, good stubble to uh, plant into because you've got quite a bit of bare soil and, um, you know, plant populations all kind of let Tate go through that. So I don't know if you've got anything to add. Uh, oh, I guess I'm more towards the cause and effect side of things. I think y'all have heard a lot of science and data and stuff like that today. So, uh, and I'm not a speaker like a lot of these guys as well. So bear with me. I used to hold a guitar up here doing this kind of stuff. So this is new. Um, I guess I started doing it in about 18 and saw some pretty neat things. It started really, you know, I don't, you go strip the outside row or your pivot and that last one's always just a little bigger. You know, so I thought, well, what if that one, that next one wasn't there? Um, so I guess just the thought when I was younger kind of started with that and then, uh, you know, made some connections in other places and uh, watched some other guys just collaborated and, and got to start seeing some neat things. So uh, it's, it's neat to, to share and uh, uh, see so much interest in it. But uh, I guess I did it in a little more unorthodox way, but... Um, uh, you know, it was uh, it was a lot of error before we started seeing some better success, and it was it may still be a little unpopular. Uh, there's some risk to it, and uh, I guess we can just kind of roll through whatever you have here and take it in pictures. This was uh, an accident to a point, but uh, that's 120 inch cotton that I planted with a 40 inch planter. Uh, that was in I believe. That was in 2020. Uh, didn't have enough water here as it was. Uh, this cotton actually got uh, abandoned and that's why I uh, planted it on that spacing and there was an 80 inch cotton next to it on the remaining 60 acres. Uh, that made somewhere close to 400 pounds being watered up and walked away and that was in 2020. And that's to the land acre. Uh, and I don't remember what's the uh, conversion, the factor on 120. I don't remember, yes. So you can do the math there, but this was, um, I just kind of wanted to see that. It, it, it seemed to have a, uh, it seemed to be really patient. Uh, this, is, this was rotated and it was on radish ground. Uh, so I guess the balance fertility really was there and uh, it, it was just water. There was no uh, additional fertilizer applied. Um, 
but primarily I'm, I'm 80 inch. I was 100% 80 inch this past year and uh, had some good success with it and uh, some surprises and some disappointments. And uh, I guess go ahead there. Yeah, I've got a couple of things in here about grain sorghum that we're going to cover, but uh, really wanted him to talk through this uh, extra wide row spacing and, you know, it, it worked even though it was a mistake and sometimes that's where we learn our best things. Yeah, and it can get you in a lot of trouble come harvest time, as you can imagine. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the big part of that is that you've got just a bigger, bigger volume of soil to be able to pull from as long as you've got the ability for those roots to go out there and grab sure. some of that, no matter really what crop we're looking at. Um, you know, looking at sorghum, Tate uh, approached me, uh, I guess, what, in 21? 21. And I uh, said, hey, I'm, you know, we've learned some of this stuff on cotton. Let's, let's give it a shot in grain sorghum. And I said, well, I mean, yeah, let's do it. And uh, so he was generous enough to uh, stick a pivot out where he did uh, both 40-inch and 80-inch uh, grain sorghum. Uh, and really, to me, it made a lot of sense just because of the ability of that sorghum plant to tiller. Uh, and also to more or less flex the, uh, the size of its heads. And I felt like if we can get more sunlight down to the, uh, to the base of that plant, that's whenever we start developing tillers, uh, which is a problem whenever we're planting uh, into June. Uh, in a lot of cases behind a failed co cotton crop, we don't have the ability to build those tillers like we normally do on an earlier planted uh, scenario. And so we just kind of stuck it out there, played with it um, and watched it. And, uh, and overall, I mean, I was fairly happy with it. I was probably the biggest concern I had was that it was gonna fall over. Okay. Uh, but whenever you go out and look at stalk size, uh, you know, we had a much bigger stalk that was, that was feeding that much uh, more robust root system uh, that was feeding that plant to, to help it stay and uh, let you comment on what that did and your your observations yeah this was about 10 acres of 80s and I, the picture doesn't show it but just right on the right side of that picture was it moved we switched it to 40s and this this is just kind of part of how the trial was and uh i don't have the exact numbers i think that these 80s on that 10 acres it was like 6200 pounds versus a little over 7,000 on the 40s uh, this has a established well dead now radish crop in it and i've noticed I think a difference in the radish behind the 80 inch milo versus the 40 inch milo, whether it's a, you know, leftovers, um, less, you know, maybe it had a little leftover moisture or it was allowed to uh, just healthier soil or whatever that may be. But I thought that was pretty neat to see. I think there's probably less allelopathy happening with that residue breaking down, better yes. soil structure, but we don't know the, yes. the real answer, but sure. well, that's kind of where my head's going. Uh, you know, looking at seeding rates, one thing to keep in mind on grain sorghum, if you are considering this is, you know, everybody asks me how, how many pounds do I need to plant? Well, every one of those uh, seed lots is going to be a little bit different. So we started trying to transition guys into thinking about plant populations. Uh, over on the right here, we've got just some guidelines that we kind of work with, but really, you know, having a full moisture profile is, is really for any crop to get started is gonna help us get through things, help us build that root system early. Um, but, you know, just kind of some general guidelines that we've worked with help you, you know, get through those periods of drought. Um, you know, if we do start tillering one, and I'll show this here in a, in the next slide, but um, what we've noticed with these wider spacings is that even those tillers are maturing about at the same rate uh, versus some stuff that was solid planted this year that tillers came on really late. And we we're waiting on you know a freeze to to get that get that out, but I don't know what population were you uh, working I with planted, on this sorghum? Uh, I guess it was two a foot on on each one, so the forties were twenty six and the eighties were thirteen. Yeah, and felt like there was plenty of space every, out there. Every seed came up as well, and and seed depth I feel like was uh, it seemed like it kick started really well. Uh, that mm -hmm. was planted rather deep. Yeah, which we recommend planting grain sorghum deeper than most people want, somewhere in that inch and a half to two inch range to get make sure you get those brace roots developed. Uh, that little bitty seed can come up from a from a pretty good way. So uh, speaking of moisture, you know, we've we've talked about this, touched on it, but you know, feel like it's very important to have as full a profile as you possibly can, you know, preferably in that three to four foot range. 
uh, to get that crop established and let those roots go out and, and start mining for moisture, nutrients, and, uh, and anchoring itself into the ground. Um, you know, targeting that, your plant population based off of that, you know, what you've got out there for a moisture profile as well as what the, what the season looks like it's going to give us. I'm, I'm a big fan of planting thin to win on the grain sorghum just because it does have that ability to stretch out there and, uh, and do some, you know, some great things from a tiller standpoint or flexing the size of those heads. But it seems like whenever we stretch the, those plants out to that wider spacing, we get into that grain fill period into August. Those plants are just sitting there and they're not wilting down. They're not, you know, just looking droughty. They're, they're still hanging in there and doing what they need to do to fill grain out. And wouldn't you say that you saw the same thing? Yes, and maturity wise, I mean, you know, wider row is a wider row, but you know, it's a, maybe it varies, you know, less on a grain, of course, than cotton, you know, but uh, it was at the end that was more interesting to me uh, to see it, you know, the, the finish of it and just really see it uh, flex there at the end on the on the wider row uh, but i felt like it, it finished close together even though you wouldn't you wouldn't think that'd be the case right so this is just some pictures that i snapped uh at the uh you know there towards the end of the season uh two different growers uh tate obviously had the 80 inch because we're sitting here talking about it and another guy down the road uh planted 40 inch they weren't exactly the same plant and date, but, but uh, somewhere there in June. And uh, really what I was out looking at was just, you know, where's our yield gonna come from on each one of these? And so over here on the left on the 80s, that's one, you know, one seed. We've got three heads that are, that are working towards yield. I've got three heads showing over here, but that's all from uh, individual seed. We didn't tiller at all on this, uh, on this field on the right. They both made very similar uh, similar yields, but, you know, we're able to, uh, to handle things, you know, from a little less money put into this crop. And, uh, some of the comments that Tate's made is, is that next crop coming behind us, you know, seems like it's doing much better, uh, from an establishment standpoint. And, uh, and once again, planting into June, we just don't see tiller development. And if we do, it's, it's going to delay maturity. And I don't feel like this delayed maturity at all. They all, um, matured about at the same time. Um, and I don't know, these fields are probably, you know, five or six miles apart over there in Floyd County. Anything else? I don't believe so. Uh, I'm going to let Tate take this one over, but just looking at some other crops, you know, behind these wide rows and what they're seeing and then some of the things that he's doing in, in a wide row wheat, uh, the 20 inch wheat uh, spectrum. I guess on this, you know, uh, if you ever have a row plug up, y'all probably don't ever do that like I do. You get to watch it all year right there on the highway. Uh, you know, that row next to it, it noticeably usually better, especially in a drier year. Um, I, guess I used to plant 10 inch wheat and I moved to an air seeder. It was a 32 row uh, 15 and I'm 40 and 80 and occasionally 120 inch cotton. So I wanted something a little more symmetrical. So I, I moved it to, we dropped eight rows and moved it to a 20 inch uh, rig, which was not very, I wouldn't recommend it. I would start with a 20 inch of other means, but, uh, and it was just more symmetrical to allow a, uh, a better gap in between the you know the following following crop whether it's a radish or uh, just kind of some uh, diversification there as far as spacing and room and options uh, 22 wheat was uh, this is probably the highest yielding field I had and that's cotton stalk wheat behind 80 inch 80 inch cotton it somewhere around 20 20 bushels which is what we seem to be real good at anyway um, I don't think that it has the high floor of a narrower row, but uh, that's to be determined, I guess. Uh, I've seen 40 to 45 on 20 inch wheat, but like I said, it was more about the symmetrical reason of uh, being able to plant in between and follow with certain cover crops or cotton. Yeah, I feel like, you know, this is not where you're going to go be pushing for 80 or 100 bushel uh, wheat yields. This is, uh, maybe the difference between making something and not making something and maybe even just putting something in the bin to plant next year. Um, but 
you know, planting this in those tough dry land, uh, really limited water situations where, you know, you're going to be fighting stress there late in the season into May and June anyway. Yes. And fallow, you know, if it's a fallow opportunity where you have the open ground, I don't know how early, but you would want to plant it earlier just to allow the tillering, especially given the wider row spacing. And as far as touch on weeds a little bit, you would think, you know, oh, well, you don't have shade now, weed suppression and you spray when you need to spray, but I just haven't really seen the, uh, if any more weed pressure go into this. And I don't know if that's uh, just, uh, uh, you know, giving it the right culture or, uh, you know, conditions uh, to battle that in other ways. That's, maybe that's a Dr. Zach question. <laughs> All right, switching over to cotton. Uh, some benefits of wide row cotton that we've seen is, you know, more open canopy, uh, letting light get down into that canopy, uh, which really is, is helping, um, you know, mature bowls is also helping put on those vegetative bowls, uh, being able to get into that field to do various, um, applications of whatever it may be, herbicides, fertilizer, uh, PGRs, whatever that may be, uh, Feel like that open canopy's keeping some of the pests and diseases that we may deal with from time to time out of out of the equation just because there's more air movement more heat uh, in that canopy and uh and then seeing better water use efficiency and, and fertilizer use and we'll show that on a couple slides here in a second uh any comments you've got i mean i, I think the most obvious thing is water water use and uh as far as strictly cotton on a wider row, it's just, it's uh, discipline, uh, PGRs, and there's, it's just the balance of each one. You know, if you have, if you're able to water uh, too much, it's definitely something that I, you gotta be careful with because it can, it can hurt you the other way much easier than you would think. Uh, I don't know that percentage. I guess it varies farm to farm, soil type, uh, your CEC, your pH, a lot of other factors, but, uh, Overall, you're, it's just very, very forgiving and, you know, uh, 80s are obviously a lot different than uh, 60s, but, you know, once you go to 90s, I know Patrick's done some 90s and, uh, and you get out to 120s and it just, it just never stresses. But if you ended up with a wet year or, or it's not a, a limited water scenario, then uh, I think that's just farm to farm on trying to find that spacing and then it, you know, after that, it would become your seed spacing from there. And then we'll get into varieties or other habits. Uh, just a couple of pictures here, but uh, we were fortunate enough this year to be working with, with a grower out in that neck of the woods that uh, we took up. Uh, it was a big pivot, 2.6 gallons across the whole thing. And we decided, okay, we're going to plant half of it in 60s, half of it in uh, 30s put moisture sensors out there and, and kind of track and see what we what we could find. And so up at the top is is what we call our profile sum graph and just showing, you know, first thing is we delayed irrigation on both of these treatments till around the first of July. Um, and then just really kind of watched watched what happened. And and at first I was a little disappointed just because the 60 inch rows appeared to have pulled down pretty hard. But um, whenever we started digging a little bit deeper into each individual uh, uh, sensor, so we, we've got these sensors out there that are ever four inches down to 36. Um, we started noticing that, um, that those roots were getting much deeper, much earlier on the 60 inch cotton than they were on the 30s. And, uh, and in, in a case they were, you know, we were starting to see that that was affecting how we were managing that irrigation, knowing that we had a, you know, a bigger bank to pull from early on. And, uh, really once it hit that level, uh, there in the in, end of July, 1st of August, we started seeing that, um, uh, those plants just, they weren't stressing versus the uh, 30 inch stuff looked like, you know, right behind the pivot, it was it was uh, starting to draw down pretty quick. And so just a couple of different observations that we saw there, it does take a little bit different management from, a, um, from an irrigation standpoint. And like several have, have uh, mentioned, uh, delaying that first irrigation, as long as you've got some moisture out there for, for roots to go get, but we don't wanna 
you know, shock that plant by putting on too much and it thinks that everything's going to be hunky dory and then it doesn't uh, set those roots out uh, to go exploring for more and more. Um, these two fields were pretty close in yield, you know, 30s was 1268, the 60s was around 1195 um, to the land acre and uh, but we had quite a bit less money into, into that 60 inch cotton. Um, so a pretty neat deal. And then I got to thinking, well, I've got imagery on these two fields and, uh, it's kind of screwy how we've got that set up in our system. But, um, this was taken in the middle of July and noticing that that 60 inch cotton was not stressing near as hard as the 30 inch cotton and uh, kind of blew my blew my mind away as, as we were starting to dig through some of the data. We saw that out there in the field throughout the growing season, and I think you'd attest to that as well, um, making it all the way into August, and that, that plant just never suffered, never really kicked off a whole lot of fruit uh, versus the 30 inch. Looking at a, another scenario, and, and this is two separate farmers, so it's hard to make those kind of comparisons, but they were um, you know, right down the road from each other. And looking at over here on the left where we had 80 inch rows on 80 inch tape, uh, and then down the road a uh, mile or two was 40 inch rows on 80 inch tape. And, and just watching how the, the two of these systems um, reacted to the water management uh, the guy on 80 inch rows, 80 inch tape, um, this is the first time that we'd ever done a moisture sensor on him. So there, it took a little learning curve to, um, you know, to trust what that information was giving him. Uh, but it was also pretty interesting to watch, you know, we, we'd let that thing dry down to, you know, half to three quarters of an inch and just replace that every, you know, every week. And, uh, but we were seeing, um, you know, I don't, we're seeing activity all the way through the through the uh, rooting profile uh, down to 36 inches versus over here on this 40 inch rows, 80 inch tape. You know, we really didn't start touching uh, those bottom sensors until late into August after we'd caught some uh, pretty decent rains. And uh, you know that you know both both fields made pretty well, but you know just seeing the difference in how those plants were reacting uh, both above ground where there was very little stress on the 80 inch, quite a bit of stress on the 40s. We ended up pitching off quite a bit of fruit. Uh, and then looking down below the, the surface to say, okay, what are we, you know, what's going on here? What are we doing? And we'll make a couple of changes uh, on, the, uh, on the 80 inch drip tape, just um, especially with delaying that first irrigation. We wanna see those roots get below that drip line before we really start hammering it uh, very hard and then you know, shutting it off at the end of the growing season. So I don't know what your thoughts are on, on some drip tape, Tate, um, with what you've noticed. I'm primarily pivots, but uh, I think the main thing is, is, is not to allow a, a lazy root system. Like you said, you've got you've to gotta establish a profile or hopefully you get some help early. Um, and it's just a, it's a time thing and you, you've, you've got to be disciplined enough, like I said earlier, to uh, you know, manage your, your timing and your, your your water uh, it's hard to hard to wait it's hard not hard to leave the wells off especially in the conditions that we're used to especially when everybody else cranks up around you that's, tr that's right <laughs> yeah uh just kind of got to go through a couple of management tips that we've learned um you know seeding population i feel like you can go as low as as you want to go um you know there are some some seed quality uh considerations that you want to take into account uh but you know, I don't know that we've pushed this as low as it can possibly go yet. Uh, would love to see a little more work on that. Um, you know, delaying that first irrigation, uh, reducing the, the amount of nitrate source nitrogens that you're using and uh, switch to some ammoniums. And that will also help keep that plant in check from a height standpoint and uh, improving your calcium nutrition. Frequent use of PGRs and kind of our, our rule of thumb has been to have at least 16 ounces of, of uh, you know, PGRs in there by the time it hits first flower and then, and then you know, rocking and rolling through the rest of the growing season. And keep in mind that wide row cotton is probably gonna be just a little bit later than, than uh, you know, your standard row configuration just because it takes a few more days to backfill those, uh, those bowls on those vegetative branches. 
Yeah, I mean, every, everything is time, especially when you're when you're putting this kind of a load on a plant. Um, this was actually my. This is the highest yield I've ever made on on 80 inch cotton. It was it was over 1,800 pounds to the land acre, and it was you can imagine a little bit of a nightmare to strip. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, it's it's rotated ground and uh, composted and, and, and a little bit of nitrogen, but uh, you know, Mother Nature allowed uh, this to really happen more than more than irrigation. But this was a weaker water place, and you know, that naturally allowed the I think a you know a good taproot to start. And then later in the season, we ended up with some nice rains, and uh, it all just came together. But uh, on the PGR standpoint, that's that's where you've you've got to stand on it, and you've got to start early. And it's getting out that wide, it's pretty hard to over picks it, but you still can. And I've seen both sides of that story. You know, a, a plant that you thought, oh, well, I, I missed that one. And it made 200 pounds over the one that you thought you did just perfect. So it's just still, still trying to figure it out. A lot of, a lot of uh, years left to try to find that balance. Even if you don't think you need it early, you're probably gonna need it. You should, yeah, well, most cases. Just some stuff that we've kind of dug up and uh, kind of justified what we're uh, what we're seeing on this wide row cotton. You know, typically you're um, on a standard row configuration. Your you know your yield is going to be coming from those you know main fruiting branches, and the shift in the wide row cotton is that it's coming from primarily your vegetative branches. Um, you know, there's a big correlation between the number of bowls per acre. Um, and yield and you know obviously if you got more of them out there the better it's going to be and and so that you know it's amazing you can go out there and pull some of these uh branches off and there's you know six eight different positions out there that are that are actually made uh that you know in a standard configuration you, you're not going to see and and it boils down to that plant knows its nearest neighbor from the time that it uh takes up water in in the uh in the germination process and it starts determining what it's going to uh, what that plant's going to be that early. Uh, there is a weak correlation between the number of bowls and, and lint per bowl, um, which may surprise some people in here. Uh, I'll let Tate talk about you know, fiber quality and what he's seen out of that, but we have you know measured around 30% uh, increase in water use efficiency. Uh, we're still trying to validate some fertilizer numbers, but I uh, feel like somewhere in that 15 to even 30% uh, could be possible. Uh, you're reducing your seed cost by half. So there's quite a few different things uh, to work with there uh, and easier to implement, you know, controlled traffic farming and, and those kind of things. So uh, Tate, if you've got anything on fiber quality. Yeah, I mean, primarily it's, it's, it's pretty consistently uh, better. You know, it comes down to the harvester, I would say. And then that, uh, that varies depending on variety. Um, you know, you're, you're gonna, Defoliation is extremely important, and I mean, there's there's extra passes involved, uh, you know, and that's that's dependent on variety, what product you use, what uh, you know, temperatures, and all that. So it can it, it can it can sneak up on you and hurt you. But as far as fiber quality itself, it's uh, I'd say it's it's much more consistent. And as far as the uh, in between, uh, you're talking about controlled traffic. Uh, yeah, it's it's nice having that much room. Uh, at times, but it just allows for more things. I guess uh, some of the things that we've noticed is that we, in these drier years, we are seeing uh, improved fiber length, uh, and of course, you know that's tied to genetics as well. Uh, and probably the, like Tate said, the the biggest issue would be you know bark and things like that. As long as you got your uh, plant conditioned, ready for harvest, and don't get in too big a hurry and shove all that through there. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that picture or not, but. Uh, yeah, this was, this was also one of the higher, higher yielding. This is, this is 1820. Uh, now this, this would be really similar to the, the previous or two yeah. slides ago, but. Uh, All right, it's a couple of golden rules as far as it relates to, to wide row cotton from what, you know, a few of us have learned in this and uh, we can always add to this thing. But you know, do feel like working with an experienced agronomist um, is is very important. Just because uh, you know we've seen some of these things, there are some differences in how 
it needs to be managed and uh, not that somebody can't learn pretty quick, but you know, working with somebody, don't just kind of go out there willy nilly and thinking that it's all going to work out great. Um, you know, knowing soil types, being able to match up varieties, populations, uh, you know, water management, all those kind of things uh, is always important. Knowing what, uh, you know, starting off with a good soil test to know what you've got to start with. Uh, any kind of tissue sap sampling during the growing season is is uh, helpful um, to understand, you know, where do we need to push, where do we need to pull back. Uh, you know, planting in the stubble, I think, is very important. Having some ground cover, you know, for a multitude of reasons that we've discussed here, you know, for for quite a few years. Uh, but you've got a lot of wide space out there uh, that's open to the elements and, uh, you know, just helping with water infiltration, helping with weed suppression and just keeping a cooler uh, canopy temperature. Having a plan for weeds, um, I don't know. Tate, what's your, uh, what's kind of your program on, on weed control whenever you got that much wide space? Uh, you know, it's kind of similar to the wheat. Uh, you know, I'd like to think it's just, uh, you're giving it a chance to, to, to naturally kind of start helping that. And I mean, rotation is key in all of that. And, uh, I'm, I'm, as Chris discussed yesterday and you know, the, the radish is the, is, has kind of been the, the, the golden ticket to that. And that's hard to, uh, fit in there because the window is so small um, and you know a timely rain is necessary but uh, this was that was a big part of you know going ahead even where I had the water to grow 40s you know looking at the sustainability aspect and profitability uh, to accept a lesser yield maybe maybe not to have the water on my timeline and you know where a pivots let's say cut in half fallow Mm -hmm. to go ahead and go to the other side and, and incorporate that rider. So to your weed question, I just have really seen a response uh, in that uh, radish crop following year. And that's also been, I think, like Chris said, some of my best cotton. And so it's been really neat to see. Yeah. I think we've covered the plant on a full profile. If you, if you can, uh, I think that's the key to really growing anything out in this part of the world. We've, we've got to have a bank to pull from. We, we don't have enough to just keep living paycheck to paycheck. So uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, we've, you know, there's been variations of, of skip row, wide row for a number of years. Uh, you know, growing up in Swisher County, we've done a lot of two in and one out, seen two in and two out. We've, and now we're kind of playing with just one in, one out, I guess is what you'd call it. Uh, but, you know, making that match up to your operation and, uh, and, you know, trying it out, learning um, is is the best way to go about that. Uh, you know, other parts of this, establishing a good healthy stand, um, you know, good good quality seed, you know, looking at some seed treatments and just having a good quality seed bed to plant into with, with good proper fertility. Um, you know, being, you know, giving you the option to go out and do some stuff with volunteer uh, cotton, I know Chris talked about that yesterday. Uh, I don't know that it, that it's any worse in this scenario than it would be in a in a solid planted stand. Plus, you got a wide row there to to move over if you needed to, from a rotation standpoint. And then fitting this into your rotation, looking at other crops that would work with it, whether it be wheat, milo, uh, you know, or just a cover crop scenario. Anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean on kind of back on the seed deal and you know variety you've got to pick what variety works for you and you know I've got varieties that work great on one farm and they don't on the next but uh, I guess that's probably similar across the room but my favorite varieties are the hardest ones to get up it never fails and so when you go out that wide you know it, it's your stand is very very important and so and that goes back to the harvest uh, challenges when you you know a, a three foot gap's not very fun well a three foot gap every 30 seconds is really not very fun even though it compensates and can make make up for the gap it's not um, it's not as efficient come harvest time um, so that's that's always something to think about you know if you're going to widen it out there's not a row 40 inch over to forgive that gap it's uh, it can cause some problems Uh, kind of finishing this thing out, just talking about some crop rotation. Uh, Tate's doing some neat things with radishes and, and various other covers. And uh, so I'll kind of let you kind of cover what y'all are learning on that side. Oh, my rotation's pretty 
pretty repetitive. I've kind of found something I like, but this is uh, this would have been 20 inch wheat followed by uh, 20 inch radish come August, and then it goes to cotton. Like I've said before, um, and this was also where I was able, I, I irrigated this up, uh, and then I think it ended up getting a rain anyway. Uh, and then I've, I've uh, experimented some with the sun hemp. I know Stephen is, and, and his dad George have done some, some, sun, some sun hemp. And so this was, uh, I just thought this was pretty, and so I, uh, this was kind of accidental. This, I have a designated 80 inch planter and it was still hooked up. So when I got done planting, I thought, well, I'm gonna go plant some sun hemp on 80s. And this is in a fall, uh, third rotation cotton wheat fallow. Uh, it got about seven foot tall and started flowering. I didn't, I was still learning about sun hemp at the time. So I, I shredded it. I thought, well, let's put that back to the ground and not use any chemical. So I shredded it. And then I come in with a, the air seeder with 20 inch radish behind it. Uh, and it grew back with about four tenths of rain to that in no time flat and flowered again. So now I know it can do that, but this will, and it's, it's, of course it's, it's terminated now. So this will be given if there's a 40, uh, uh, full profile, this will be 80 inch cotton, uh, this next se this upcoming season. Yeah, we've had really good uh, results with all kinds of different sun hemp combinations, whether it's in a you know full mix or doing it as a as a crop by itself. But it's amazing to go back behind it and measure nitrogen uh, that's that's left for the next crop anywhere from thirty to I've even measured it as high as ninety pounds, and and uh, and really think it it works well with with your hay grazers if you're going to do something in the in the summer and. Uh, and I like this wide row configuration for incorporating the radishes in there too. Yes, and the shading. And I know Lacey spoke about some of this yesterday, uh, just as far as the snowball effect. And um, you would think, oh, well, you're planting this crop. Well, then you're gonna plant this crop. Well, this is dry land, what are you doing? And it's surprisingly wet today. I could go plant something out there today and, and get a stand just because of the shading and uh, cover. Well, that was all that we had. I guess we'll be around uh, later to answer any questions.